signori, buonasera. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome everybody. First of all, I would like to welcome our president, Mr. Paolo Gentiloni. who is here with us today and with us is going to officially open this uh, 38th edition of the meeting for friendship amongst peoples and I would like to welcome the ambassadors, the authorities and all of you. This is the first meeting of this 38th edition of our meeting. So what we have uh, bequeathed uh, needs to be regained and earned again and uh, this is uh, this year's meeting topic and certainly this topic now more than ever gets uh, several meanings because we have to face uh, the terrible violence of those who despise life uh, and those who destroy other people's lives and their own lives. And the events of Barcelona urge us to ask ourselves if uh, we have uh, enough reasons to live and if we have enough reasons to see people die. I mean, we need to ask ourselves uh, what uh, we have to do. We have to face uh, very difficult questions. We need to put ourselves at stake and face these problems, these challenges, because we need to find answers. So what can we expect from this week? What can we expect from the upcoming week full of events? What can we expect from all the things we are going to learn and discover? Well, I think we can get a lot from that. The first gain that we can expect is that certainly this uh, mating this year is going to make uh, ourselves more aware of the fact that uh, we're all the result of a legacy of some form of heritage, but sometimes we're not aware of that. Sometimes we lose sight of these facts, but we exist because we result from some form of inheritance. We are made of that. We are all sons and daughters. We have a national identity. We have values. We have, in many cases, a religion. Many of us come from 70 years of peace. Every one of us had decisive encounters. Everyone has a story, has an education. So this is something we need to be aware. So this is the very first gain we can get. But the second possible gain from this year's meeting is that we can't help asking ourselves what uh, has happened to this heritage, to this legacy, because we're faced uh, with such incredible challenges. We're faced with uh, such a complicated reality that uh, let's not hide it uh, is absolutely frightening sometimes. Uh, well, that we can't help uh, asking ourselves so many questions. We need to put our inheritance, inheritance and legacy to the test and see if uh, that can stand uh, today's challenges. But then there's something more. There's another element we can get and we can gain from this year's meeting that is even more fascinating and moving at the same time. Because, well, the fact uh, of uh, questioning my own uh, legacy doesn't uh, push me to close myself into my identity, not at all. This is something I share with any other individual, regardless of other people's stories and origins, because I share the desire for the good, for the truth, the same thing that uh, 
all the other human beings want. So we're all faced with the same questions and desires and wishes. So sometimes we use different uh, tools. We have different cultural legacies, different sensitivities, languages, and accents. But actually, well, these differences make dialogue even more interesting. You make encounters and mutual forgiveness something we cannot live without. Well, considering this setting, I would like once again to thank our president, Mr. Gentiloni, for his presence. The meeting organizers, but also the meeting participants, consider dialogue extremely important, and also the dialogue with decision makers, because we learned from Don Giussani to consider reality important, to consider also politics important, we need uh, to consider always other people's commitments and needs. And uh, the real resource is the uh, wish and desire for good for everybody. So, Mr. President, we would like uh, to give our contribution in order to better understand today's problems and challenges, but without forgetting this desire for good. We do not uh, want to feel uh, sort of resigned. We do not want to renounce and give up, not at all. We would like to seize this valuable opportunity to see uh, what are the good things around and which are the possibilities for dialogue and uh, for building a future together. Well, now I would like uh, to read to all of you the message sent to our President of the Republic, and uh, we are extremely grateful to him because uh, he always uh, sends us words. So on the opening day of the 2017 meeting, I would like to express my warmest greetings to you and all those who will take part in events in Rimini, along with my best wishes for getting to fruitful results, thus helping the entire society strengthen its cohesion in line with the values enshrined in our constitution. This year's team, theme, all that you have bequeathed you by your father, earn it in order to, re to possess it, is a clear reference to the responsibilities involved in intergenerational relations. There are responsibilities ascribed to adult people who must not overuse resources and opportunities, thus taking them away from their children. There are responsibilities ascribed to young people who are compelled to make things and stories their own, to give them a future and play a protagonist role in it. The world we live in has become increasingly smaller and is changing at an ever faster speed. Globalization on the one hand and technological development on the other call into question the autonomy itself of individuals. The notion of liberty, the sense of community, and the ambition of making history need to be continuously reformulated to be lived in the present. The young can and must be protagonists in this epoch-making change. The demographic crisis is a burden on our society and tends to limit the horizon we look at, thus forgetting to prepare for tomorrow. The living and forward-looking forces have the duty to raise awareness on the consequences of today's choices and to contrast the short-sightedness of those who give up and stop looking ahead while making plans for the future. Being aware of our responsibility towards those who will come after us is similar to expressing solidarity towards those who are in need. Without these vital drivers, there is no continuity in the life of a community, and the very developmental capabilities of a society become significantly weaker. The political world, institutions, the economic stakeholders, and the social parties, all of them play a key role in determining the results of the changes taking place. Complexity and interdependence are no excuse for disengagement. Attention towards young people must translate into tangible opportunities and innovations, thus paving the way to a real social mobility and to full citizenship, beginning with the right to work and education, which are the pillars of liberty for people and society. This way, by investing in our future, a community can recover its confidence and double its own strength. Undersigned by Mr. Sergio Mattarella, President of the Italian Republic. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. President, for this message because we are proud to open our meeting with this message. Now, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Abdul Abdelaziz Azer, Al Azer, who is going to read the message sent by the Secretary General of the United Nations for this opening. Thank you. Your Excellency Paolo Gentiloni, Prime Minister of Italy, Excellencies, religious leaders, ladies and gentlemen, I have the utmost pleasure to be here in Rimini again for this meeting of friendship among people. I say again because five years ago, in August 2012, I spoke here in my former capacity as the president of the 66th session of the United Nations General Assembly. As for today, I am pleased to deliver a message on behalf of His Excellency United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who conveys his profound regrets at being unable to attend himself due to prior engagement. The Secretary General's message is based on the theme you have chosen for this 38th edition event Quoting from Gotti's Faust, all that you have bequeathed you by your father, er it an order to possess. This quote learned from Faust, it means that in order to really benefit from a legacy, we must first understand the lesson and the responsibilities underlying such legacy. We must avoid Faust's behavior, who despite being highly successful, but yet dissatisfied with his life leads him to make a pact with the devil, exchanging his soul for unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures, spoiling his love and legacy, and at the end, losing it all. We arrive at this moment in time and space shaped by the good and bad decisions made by our fathers, who much time and thought, do we really spend learning from the lessons and responsibilities entitling our right to their legacies? We can only guess, for example, who much richer our inheritance might have been without the horrors of World War I and World War II. But let us hope that we have learned and earned from their sacrifices and also their wise decisions. Made during and after those troubling times, such as the United Nations Charter and its Universal Convention on Human and Civil Rights. The act of earning and possessing does not flow just one way. It also means passing on the others, those who come after us, the next generations. In fact, 
we can never really possess. We only own for a while in order to pass on to the next generations. We, will, we owe as much, if not more, to those who come after us as we do, to those who came before. One of the key concepts flowing from our dialogue on sustainable developments is the idea of intergenerational equity. What legacy are we learning? We leaving our children and grandchildren in the expectation of our natural resources and our abuse of the planet as a sink for global waste. The mounting threats to the future of our planet require us to give greater attention on how we produce and consume goods. The ecosystem is limited and while not be able to sustain much more excessive growth, this imbalance and resources use acquisition and control provides tender for regional wars, conflicts, and various forms of extremism, which also serve to destabilize populations and provoke migratory surge to the determined of all. Air, water, and food are the three indispensable of fundamentals of human existence. Which people in developed countries invariably take for granted because they have always been available? Then what else have we inherited? We have as legacy a world with people full of differences different cultures, different traditions, different religions, different skin colors, different ideas, and different experiences. All to compare and to share. Diversity, first of all, recognize that the human families is made up of a rich array of peoples, social, standing, and wealth. Diversity is a human and avoidable condition. It is a characteristic common to humanity, and diversity is also a nature itself. Diversity of flowers, vegetations, soils, resources, weather, human knowledge, and wealth, which we must share fairly between ourselves. The challenges we face are great. The United Nations seeks partnership and leadership from diverse groups, NGOs, private sector, academia, religious, and civil leaders. Where are the leaders who are prepared to act for generation yet unborn? What legacy shall we bequeath our children and grandchildren? What legacy will we leave them to pass on their children? The great test for human leadership and for the United Nations in this century is to make sure the earth remains a habitable home for humanity. Let not forget that first a story started in heaven, but it is on earth that we should work to nurture a legacy based on the joy of living and happiness for mankind and the next generation. End of message. Thank you very much, and I wish you a successful
Grazie, grazie del messaggio del segretario generale. Grazie del... Thank you, thank you very much for your presence and for the message of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Now we are going to hear more about uh, the perspectives and outlooks for Italy. So we are still devastated by what we saw in Europe over the last few days. But we organized a meeting because we believe in life, we believe in justice, we believe in the truth. And we think that these things can win, can win over evil. But how? Well, we're going through radical changes and these uh, epoch change uh, is going to be faced uh, during this year's uh, uh, edition. And uh, we have uh, already faced this topic uh, in Milan some time ago, and uh, Mr. Caron faced it, but we're going to face it again. So what are we going through exactly? Well, I try maybe to say something that may sound a bit bizarre, especially about Italy. I'm uh, a statistics expert, and everybody likes to talk about averages. And we like to say that now Italy is the place of diversity and variability. Let's take uh, the demographic crisis. There was a drop in the birth rate, and that uh, jeopardizes uh, our future economic life. But in spite of that, uh, there are many families uh, that have children. Often, these families are not uh, the wealthiest one. And so why is it so that some people still decide to have children and others do not? And then immigration. Many people are so much worried by immigration. And uh, we have uh, headlines and news on that. But still, we see that there are places where this is a fact, it's not a problem. We can see it uh, in our exhibition about uh, new Europeans. Well, there are people who are considered and consider themselves as Italians and not a second generation, but they have uh, different maybe skin colors, but they are Italian and uh, they do a lot of things, they work, uh, they study, and they feel Italian. Why is it so that in some places, people have been able to overcome hostility and xenophobia? And then we have the entrepreneurial world. Well, the economic recovery is still hard, plus 1.5 in terms of economic growth, but still there are some companies that are still in a standstill. Other companies are thriving and uh, do a lot of exports and uh, manufacture top technological devices. Why is it so that some companies are not able to innovate and uh, others do not? Why is it so that some furniture manufacturers uh, of the north of Italy have uh, started uh, to sell their products abroad to Tehran, Melbourne or New York uh, when IKEA came to Italy. So why is it so that they had uh, enough strength to change and to make a change? And then we have uh, another key topic uh, that is work. We have an exhibition here that uh, tells us more about how the labor market is changing. And there are young people who are leaving the country and uh, get uh, enormous successful results. But still, there are young people who decide to remain in Italy and still do great things. And then let's talk about education. We have uh, many teachers. We have uh, many good teachers. And we have uh, excellent uh, 
students. And I must say that uh, we always prove to be the best when we go abroad. But why is it so? I mean, we know that uh, in the past, uh, some uh, experts said that statistics are not always reliable and uh, the principle of variability is very important and you need to consider that. And I think that uh, this idea of uh, variance is key. So all that you have bequeathed you by your father, earn it in order to possess it. Well, this sentence explains variance because uh, Italy was very poor in the past and many people had to, l to do something. So 26 million people redeveloped a country that was dead. Well, why can't this be repeated today? Well, on the one hand, we have uh, many people that uh, have always said uh, that uh, well, uh, there was not enough in Italy. There were xenophilic people. But again, when you go into Starbucks, actually what you get is the result of the great Italian the tradition. You can get a latte or a macchiato or an espresso. And that diversity stems from a certain love of diversity and beauty. And uh, Italians uh, have been great in so many things. Everybody wants a Ferrari, and Ferrari is uh, successful again. It's not about being the copies of other countries' legacies. Not at all. We need to distinguish ourselves. And we also stop looking at other people. We need to stop doing the robber necking of history, just uh, sort of looking only behind. We need to stop robber necking, otherwise we want to go ahead. We need to stop robber necking. We need to, to look ahead. But in order to do so, we need to do what the Don Giussani said. We need to criticize what was wrong in the past. It's not about uh, trying to stick to old obsolete things. No, we need to take stock of legacy and uh, innovate and change and evolve. It's not about being knife grinders again, but it's about doing something new. Well, men are always protagonists. We need uh, to so to face uh, these uh, radical changes by asking ourselves uh, what needs to be changed uh, and understand what we need to build today. What uh, do we need to build and make today? We need to do something new, looking ahead and not looking back, uh, using our strengths and not uh, relying on our weaknesses. We need to use diversity as a strength. We would like uh, that also from a political point of view, those who act and work and study should and could be rewarded. We need to reward the people working for diversity because this is what we need. We need to motivate people to change. Uh, so. We want to explain this idea of earning and possessing our legacy through this uh, willingness to pave the way for a new future. Presidente Gentiloni. President Gentiloni, Prime Minister Gentiloni, now it's your turn. Grazie. Grazie. Eh, cara Presidente Guarnieri, cara...
Dear President uh, Guarnieri, dear Giorgio Vitadini, I believe the 38th meeting couldn't be started but with uh, uh, homage to Catalonia and Barcelona by myself too. This uh, city has been devastated. This morning, the Mass for Peace was celebrated uh, in the Sagrada Familia, and a message there was delivered, a message of human strength uh, delivered to the whole of Europe. That is why from the meeting in Rimini, we want to tell to the wonderful friend Barcelona that we are standing at their side. And we want to embrace. We want to embrace all the families of Bruno Gulot and Luca Russo and Di Camilla Lopardo, the Italian citizens who lost their lives uh, in uh, that attack. Daesh has been defeated and it lost its uh, fundamental uh, mission that was to uh, transform it into a state, the, its, presence, its terroristic presence to transform it into a state, into something more organized, but the threat goes on and we must uh, acknowledge that this threat concerns us all. I do not believe to propaganda um, delivered through Jidhaist websites, but uh, I am aware that no country, and Italy is no exception, can feel safe uh, from this uh, threat. So it is really fundamental that support is given to the intelligence forces, the uh, police and all the military forces involved in the different uh, activities to guarantee our security from us all. The country must be feel united around these forces, safeguarding our security. And I would like to add that this is as important as repeating, and that's something that I keep saying and I want to state it again here, that the terrorists will not lead us to renounce to our freedom. So we will defend our freedom and uh, we are going to do this thanking all those people who make it possible for us every single day to live as we are used to live, that is free. What you bequeathed is the theme of this year's meeting, but what is the legacy we are talking about? I would like to start with uh, this idea. There are many young people here, many young people inhabiting the world, so it's the world, the dimension where we should start from. The world is at the center of many oversimplifications that are wrong in some cases, both in their in uh, parallelist versions, there are big or small kingdoms, and also there is a uh, more nostalgic views from improbable and intact ancient worlds. Either version we may consider of our view to the world cannot work. Protectionism, nationalism, and also excessive individualism or paying excessive attention to privileges, lack of responsibility towards the others, and uh, lack of regard towards uh, climatic changes in other countries. So there is an imposition of a primacy of the individual, and very often this primacy is presented as a tribute to the past. But I want to state this very clearly, dear friends. 
if this is the legacy, if this is uh, the heritage from the past, well, we are more than willing to renounce this legacy. Rather, let us wonder where this kind of narrow-minded attitude came from, because if we ignore it, we run the risk of over-celebrating openness, and we know that there are risks entailed with it. George Orwell observed that to see what uh, is standing in front of us, a constant effort is needed. Very simply, the point is that there are welfare, knowledge, and security levels, unprecedented levels, are now living side by side with a non presidenting fear for the future because the great factors at the basis of progress include threats that cannot be ignored. So globalization led 1 billion, 200 million thousand inhabitants to step out of poverty and uh, living conditions improved. Of course, globalization also eradicated some diseases and even generated some average results, and I'm referring now to Professor Vitadini, reducing the uh, levels of violence. So there is a lower level of violence compared to what has been the case in the history of our world. And certainly, the digital revolution has provided many individuals with the possibility to know and to communicate as never before. And still, while this is all true, the illusion of a universal peace and of the omnipotence of uh, the cosmopolitan individual, which has been called the man of Davos too, the one that was thought to be dominating the world, well, didn't last very long. That very short time of Belle Epoque of the 90s, between the fall of the Berlin Wall and also the collapse of the Twin Towers, as a kind of introduction to the first 10 years of the century. Those were the last 10 years of the previous century. Well, that period lasted very little. Today, the digital revolution also, it is clear that it has come with some people who lost something. And it is necessary to make a constant effort to keep, to be aware of what is really in front of our eyes. To quote Sigmund Bauman, the wide range of possibilities uh, that we all have and comparing all these to reality can create a state of happiness. The regaining of history over illusion was not free of suffering. Among its effects, we could talk about this for a long time, but among its effects, for sure, there has been the dissemination of uh, solitude. Let's consider some of the bigger European cities. There are so many families that consist of just one single person, and uh, this is well above one third of the entire number of families, of households. Solitude, social exclusion that affected the uh, weaker layer of our middle class, and that is uh, still affecting some parts of the countries and young people in particular. And then fear. Sometimes fear is fueled by a sense of threat against one's own identity. We fear to lose our identity. So the legacy we're talking about should be framed in this historical context. If we then consider all this at a national level for Italy, what do we understand when we talk about Italian legacy, Italian identity? We need to know what we are referring to to be able to make it grow and to take advantage of it. Vitadini mentioned this before. Uh, we uh, 
um, very often and probably too much in my opinion focus on the weaknesses of uh, our Italian identity. I'm not claiming they do not exist, not at all. We have weaknesses and uh, there is a difficult relations between the citizens and the state. Of course, there's differences between the north and the south of the country. And of course, we have the lack of a national story from the political elites, from the people in charge of the media. We do suffer from uh, this lack of a single story, common story. However, we should also become more accustomed to highlighting the strengths of our identity and facing all the weaknesses. We should be more ready to face the strengths of our identity. This is a heritage our heritage can help the whole of Europe not to be affected but rather be alternative to narrow-mindedness. I'm very happy that upon the celebration of the 60 years of the Rome Treaty in Italy there was a sort of a resurgence of a European proudness. People were feeling that despite all the problems locally and uh, at a continental level, there can also be an answer to the problems, to the difficulties, to the identity crisis and to the return of the nationalisms I was mentioning earlier. So if it is true that today we need roots, we need dynamism, we need culture and capacity to work and to be entrepreneurial and to have social cohesion and to be open, well, we as Italians are really able to be in this world and to face all these challenges in the world we live in because we are open to the world we have been open to the world for centuries our cities have been open to the world our companies have been open to the world what are sometimes known as uh, multinationals of a small size are evidence of this our colleague uh, Vitadini said that uh, these sorts of uh, realities have such strong roots everywhere because there is a heritage from their parents, the grandparents, and the genius loci of the territory has been building after years and years of uh, work. So they work internationally, but their roots are local, they are in Italy. So this is a strength that we have as a country. So how can we invest in this heritage? How can we take advantage of this Italian capital? Growth has started again. Finally, this is the result of all the initiatives that have been undertaken over the last few years, such as the reforms, in particular the reforms implemented by the Renzi government and that we are now uh, continuing. This was not uh, given for granted. We couldn't really give for granted to keep growth and uh, primary surplus at the same time in our budget. We couldn't really give it for granted that we would have been able to avoid that some bank crisis would uh, really uh, negatively affect the savings of many Italian families. There was no, nothing like this was granted, was given for granted in terms of uh, work and contrast to, to social exclusion also results have been obtained. I'm sure that uh, more steps will be taken, will be made ahead in the new, in the future uh, budgetary law, which will be a fundamental step to uh, close our term which is a duty that I consider very seriously and on which I will put all my effort with my government. Thanks to all the activities undertaken over the last few years, thanks to the uh, further 
adjustments made to our budgetary law that was approved uh, last spring. And thanks to all the provisions from Brussels, the budgetary law will enable us to have some more measures to guide our growth towards the right path. I specified that these measures will be just some and limited measures. It will not be an easy law. Some the measures that we will have will be really selected measures. And I want to uh, pledge before all the people in the meeting here and all the young people present here that we are going to focus all these measures, all these commitments on the uh, jobs for young people. We will do this through permanent incentives. Thank you. I need to drink. We will do this through permanent incentives for uh, employing young people, consolidating the results of the uh, Jobs Act law. We will do this through an extraordinary commitment on uh, uh, labor policies that, as you know very well, are really one of the greatest weaknesses in our system. We have a noble history in which labor has been defended, and such a defense was uh, intended as a defense of previous job posts. And today, we are still committed to this. There are more than 100 committees in the Ministry of Development and uh, Employment that are working together with the trade unions to face the problems of companies that are facing a crisis, but to take advantage of all the talents of each individual and to face the challenges that we have in front of us Defending the existing job posts is not enough. We need to favor access to the job market, to the labor market, and some specific norms to give a shock to the market are certainly necessary. And then there is the need to accompany the search for jobs when this is required. So people, citizens must be helped in this respect. And then vocational training and uh, Enterprise 2.4.0 also have to be integrated in the labor policies that should be designed to keep pace with innovation. And that's not going to be easy. We know that. Uh, even with uh, sufficient measures, these will not be enough. We know that uh, each individual's uh, story is not predetermined. So taking advantage of one's talents really depends on the commitments of uh, single individuals. We uh, visited the exhibition earlier and I was impressed by the awareness that is so much present by the organizers of uh, this exhibition. They are asking for norms, they are asking for commitment, they are asking for really a lot of work on the part of the Republic of the State. They are aware that without uh, commitment, rebuilding all uh, this path, labor path, won't be easy because we have no predetermined uh, storyboards. We don't have any pre-made script to follow. We'll try to fight against poverty and inequalities even more. And uh, I'm really ashamed of a country where a manager in a bank can earn $185 million. This is unacceptable. This is a problem for the world, for public opinion, for common sense that uh, we have to build all together. We are proud that uh, we have started uh, minimum uh, income 
the minimum wage in order to help at least the families that are suffering from poverty. And we are also proud of the method that uh, has been used by the government to work uh, with an alliance and a partnership of many other realities uh, that are part of uh, the social community of our system. And finally, let us open up our horizon, dear friends. Uh, the Magellano view has been mentioned so many times over the last few months. That is, we want to look at uh, a certain point from the destiny, the destination and not from the point of view of the person who is going to leave. We know that Magellan was Portuguese and there were many Italian people that traveled with him. So their view, their global view from the outside didn't lose the identity it had. So the challenge if we adopt this view is to invest in Africa and in the Mediterranean. We need to promote uh, development we want to promote uh, the development that was called the new name of peace by Popularum Progressum and making the migration flows manageable by defeating human trafficking, illegal migration trafficking. The phenomenon is uh, of a long-term nature. Seneca already mentioned the endless wandering of men and the geography and the landscape around us tell us that the phenomenon will stay there, that we will have to deal with it for a long time. We know that uh, those focusing on hatred and illusions will not gather any positive results in the long run. However, when I say that this phenomenon is going to be of a long-term nature, it doesn't mean that we want to give in in managing it. It doesn't mean that we want, don't want to uh, set uh, standards and objectives and limitations that have to be agreed upon together. And in this uh, respect, the Italian government has been first in doing these things. Jean-Claude Juncker did well when, said, when he said that Italy defended the honor of Europe as far as migration problems are concerned. This same government is the same government that has been promoting norms, for example, through the code of conduct with the NGOs, this code of conduct to contribute to stabilize the situation in Libya and through these initiatives it is possible to see some results now. There is a more controlled situation and also the flows are being managed in a better way. Well, we didn't fulfill this objective, let's be frank but the path is the right path and we should continue on this way. The government, considering these uh, results, should not fear the request for rights and duties on the part of those people who arrive to Italy or those people who are born in Italy and have an education in Italy. If we really love security, social security, the answer lies in the control of migratory flows and contrast of the Islamist radicalization. Response does not lie in exclusion. Response does not lie in negating reality because excluding and uh, negating reality fuel any form of negative reaction and of threat. They are not a guarantee of safety. They are a guarantee of insecurity for our country.
earning our heritage as a country means that we do not have to fear our talents. We don't have to fear this Italian capital. We have to take advantage of our Italian interests without raising walls or protectionism. Just feel Italian. There is no cosmopolitan identity, but the roots that have to be claimed must be directed towards the future. And we as Italians can look at the future with the heritage of our history and our experience much, much better than many others. If only had we the strength and the courage to be aware of this. Let's be aware of this. And I'm saying this especially to the young among you, because it will, it will be, above all, you to be aware of this extraordinary potential that is enshrined in being Italian and in taking advantage of the Italian capital. It is important to focus on networked companies, on the media, on the families. The winning Italian, the successful Italian model is also made of this social cohesion. Going back to Bauman, happiness starts at home, wrote Bauman, in contact with other people, in dialogues, in the negotiation attempts, in the fights in trying to attempt the reasons of the other. So there's no point in being willing to be a sovereign, but to be patriotic. Sociologist Manuel Castells from Catalonia said, elites are cosmopolitan, but uh, the people is local, and we have to be aware that uh, things are exactly like this, as uh, Manuel Castell referred to some years ago. So this heritage of roots, of memory, of culture, of community open to the world, the Italian capital can invest. This is the identity that should be considered in the commitment of each and every one of us so that Italy can be successful. Thank you. Vorremmo proprio We would really like to join these words with some questions asked by young people about some of the topics raised by Prime Minister Gentiloni. So the floor goes to Mr. Marco Saporiti. is one of the young people, well, actually, is the head of the group of young people that organized the exhibition that has been uh, attended by our Prime Minister before coming here. Well, good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. So I've been working on the exhibition. Every has to his work every man to his work. And uh, I'm a designer, and four years ago, before graduating, I registered my VAT number, and I started working as an independent professional. And I would like now to establish my own little company in September. But still, I see many problems, and I have uh, to overcome many obstacles uh, and bureaucratic and economic issues. So it's not easy to establish my own little company. So. I would really like to establish my company in Italy. Well, I would like to know 
how politicians and the Italian economic system are going to deal with the, these young people who want to do something in their own country. Well, wow. He's the guy who has coordinated the work on the exhibition, Every Man to His Work. So certainly, he already knows a lot. He knows communication probably much better than me. Well, actually, from what I saw at the exhibition, Personally, I had the opportunity 10, 11 years ago to be the Minister for Telecommunications. And, uh, well, that kind of ministry, well, was stopped then after my experience. Uh, somehow it was the last one. But actually, even before that experience, I was a bit doubtful about this boom of uh, businesses in the field of communication. Well, there were so many universities who started organizing communication courses. And uh, I must say that 10 years after that, uh, well, that sector has uh, showed its potential. So certainly communication is a sector where there is still a great potential to be developed. And so I feel confident about the opportunities that exist professionally in the communication world, in particular in relation to the internet and uh, to web resources. So first of all, I want to say that you need to believe in your project. And I know that you believe in your project. I can tell it from the exhibition you coordinated and organized. And uh, well, no law is easy. I mean, there is no one size fits all solution to provide uh, people with uh, flawless Me measures and uh, mechanisms. Nothing is easy. Well, we have tried over the last few years to facilitate company establishment procedures. So we try to make the life of uh, independent professional and freelancers easier somehow. And uh, we adopted specific new tax procedures and tax regimes. And uh, we also adopted a specific Jobs Act law on independent uh, workers. But much remains to be done. I saw in the room a journalist of the Corriere della Sera newspaper who usually deals with topics and who usually insists in his articles about uh, the difficulties that still exist in Italy for making a small business thrive. So we m created a sort of a flat rate tax regime. We tried to streamline a lot of bureaucratic procedures for start-up companies, for innovative SMEs. So we have done something, but certainly much remains to be done. But innovative spirit is always the key, is always one of the main driver, and we certainly need to encourage young people. Let's continue on labor market with Madalena Sakaji, another curator on this uh, exhibition about work, so every man to his work. Good evening, Mr. President. So in my professional experience over the last few years after graduating, I'm working as a legal apprentice. And I think that mating masters is key because uh, I would like to earn their knowledge and possess it and make it my own. Still, there are some problems because on the one hand, in our labor market, 
there's a, a sort of a blackmailing that occurs because sometimes you hear words like, oh, anybody can replace you. There are people who can accept a lower pays and wages and work more. And this is one problem. On the other hand, sometimes the world of research in Italy is uh, full of problems and obstacles is not very much encouraged and supported. So considering these limitations, how can we find new opportunities to provide our country with such a valuable service and also give our contribution to the growth of our society? Well, thank you very much for this question. As I said also in my speech, we really want to do something about this and our future budgetary law will include measures likely to encourage the recruitment of young people. And we want to draw on the results of the Jobs Act law, and specifically, we want to get rid of uh, those uh, blackmailing situations that you depicted, because sometimes there are people who accept to work more for less. But we do not want that to exist any longer. When it comes to the research world, we want to identify the top 180 departments of Italian university and provide them with the subsidies provided that they recruit scientists and researchers. We will try, and we hope that this will work. We think that this measure could be successful. At the same time, we're going to work on the strengthening and support of the academic world. That could be taken for granted, but it is not. Believe me, we need to further support our academic world through measures and the tools, we would like to create a no-tax area and also to reduce some tax amounts in order to encourage people to enroll to university and cover more or less some 600,000 students with these facilitations and breaks. We want to strengthen research, especially in top departments. We want to have more people going to university and attending university. We want to make our university system more appealing and also more competitive at global level. I'm not afraid of a university system that looks at the global horizon. I'm not afraid of a global oriented university, not at all. What I'm afraid of is that maybe Italy is not competitive enough to have uh, such an international university. We have the first largest uh, university population in the world, but still, I think we like behind when it comes to France or the UK. I mean, but I think that we have not enough foreign students in our universities. So our universities are not internationalized enough. Well, Germany is doing better than us in that respect. So let's not be afraid of an international system, of European system, uh, university-wise. We need to develop it even more. We need to be at the heart of this international university academic world. Well, let's conclude with another question asked by Mr. Andrea Veduto. Mr. President, the dramatic situation in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East urges politicians and decision makers to take measures. But what can Italy do in that respect? How can we support populations in their countries of origin? 
And I think, for instance, about Syria, Syria, which is a country that is now the victim of an embargo and sanctions provoked also by the international community. And what is Italy going to do? And when will Italy get back the prominent role it deserves to play, especially within the Mediterranean area? Well, I'm not uh, particularly happy about the last part of your question. I'm not particularly, let's say, enthusiastic because Italy within the Mediterranean area occupies a key position geographically and we can't do much about it. Also, when it comes to the migration policies of the European Union, we still, and we play a key role when it comes to one of the major crises of the Mediterranean, and I'm referring to the, cre the crisis of Libya. And as a European country, we've always played a key role when it comes to fighting against Daesh and terrorism. This is something that we've always done. And uh, after the US, we are the country that has the largest number of forces committed to fighting against Daesh. We play a crucial role in Lebanon. Well, in economic terms, allow me to say that if we consider the a large Mediterranean area, Italy, is one of the four large economic partners of this wide economic area. The other three are US, Germany, and China. Well, that said, I would not feel so sad or pessimistic, but still, I am worried because even if Italy is doing a lot, it plays a key role in the Mediterranean, but still the key to stabilization of the Mediterranean area has not been found yet. So what could be the solution then? Well, sometime I hear people talking about uh, some pastimes, uh, some uh, sort of uh, people who long for a certain past that was delusional. People who think that, uh, well, the past was better, but this is not like that that works. I mean, what do we need in the Mediterranean, actually? I think we need a multilateral plan, a sort of multilateral organizational structure, so that when we have to face difficult times, like it is now, because we have an unsolved crisis in Libya, an unsolved crisis in Yemen, and what about Syria? Well, we still don't know, but 60% of young people in Syria are, have left the country. And then we know that uh, things in the Gulf area are not easy too. So we need the ability to establish multilateral peace relations. During the Cold War, we experienced many situations, and then the Helsinki Treaties came. But at, the, at that time, we started questioning topics like borders, cohabitation, living together, the compliance with some key principles. And I must confess that there are some countries that are working on that now, like Q8. And Italy is a country that tries to establish multilateral relations in spite 
of the difficult times you are going through because it is essential to keep the dialogue alive. We need to put a new multilateral sort of approach be put to the test in the Mediterranean. We do not want to go back to a setting made of regional powers, not at all. We need to keep a new Mediterranean multilateralism model alive. We need to build a new multilateral order. And Italy is at the forefront. It's playing its role and doing its part, but certainly we can always do better and more. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions and thank you for participating. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thanks for coming and thanks for sharing your ideas with us and for listening to us and for answering to our questions. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.